Good evening, happy Sabbath. Shabbat. I haven't said that for a long time, because uh, we usually don't have Friday night services, but we used to a long time ago, so that's why I said I haven't done that for a long time. I'd like to invite you to kneel with me for a word of prayer as we prepare to go into the Word of God this evening. Let us pray. Father in heaven, well, tonight we come before you again as our brother Russell already prayed, but I simply just ask that we might see Jesus again. Not that we didn't hear him, but we just want to say it a hundred more times. We want to see Jesus. And tonight, Father, I place myself in your hands and I just ask that you please be kind to speak through me, take whatever gifts and talents you have enabled me to have. And Lord, I pray that you would use them for your honor and glory. I pray that you would please enable me to clearly present the principles of your word and help us understand the, the greatness of your love and that has predestined us to be saved. Abide with us. Help us to see a clearer picture of your great love for us. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite you all to turn with me in your Bibles this evening to the book of Isaiah chapter 53. And I'm going to try to get through this material. I don't usually preach for 40 minutes, so I'm going to, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to get through this. So Isaiah chapter 53 this evening. Um, again, our topic this evening is predestination and salvation. I'm not going to present this in an argumentative way, but rather I just want us to see what the Bible presents as the depth, the depth dimension of the love of God for us. Isaiah chapter 53. In Isaiah chapter 53, we have this prophecy about how God's suffering servant, which is Christ, was going to be treated by men. And in this prophecy, we can see that God's watch care, um, God's, how can I say, God's providence, God's predeterminism to save man is demonstrated along with how man is to react with that. In other words, you'll see what I uh, you'll see what I'm trying to say as we read this passage, Isaiah chapter 53, and let's begin with verse three. The Bible says here, "He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs." And carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, as we get into verses 7 and onwards, we're seeing basically a fulfillment of what happened to Jesus as he, would let, as he was led through um, Gethsemane and through Pilate's judgment hall, etc., unto the cross. And the Bible says here in verse 7, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Now, I want you to notice what it says here in verse 10. The first part of verse 10, the Bible says, Yet it did what? Yet it pleased the Lord to do what? Okay, so as we look at the sufferings of Jesus Christ, who's in charge? Is it the men that are beating him? Is it the men that are leading him captive from Pilate to Herod and back again? Is it Annas and Caiaphas? Is it the, uh, is it the, the soldiers of the, of the priests and so on? Who is really in charge of what's going on here? God the Father. It's God the Father. And yet we can see that man is connected 
intimately with the death of Jesus, and I, and I want to bring something out with that. The Bible says here, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. And when you make his soul an offering for sin, again, just repeat that part. When you make an when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall seek his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Verse 12, drop down with me to verse 12. The Bible says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, etc. The point that I want us to see here, brethren, is that we can understand from this passage that it is God's purpose that Christ suffer for us. And as we look at, um, as we look at predestination, the Bible lets us know very clearly that God is the one who is leading this out. And yet at the same time, God does not cancel out man's participation in it. Are you following me? We see here who was the one that actually led him as a sheep to the slaughter. We know that it was God that was over it all. Amen. But who was the one that led him from Pilate to Herod back to Pilate again? Who was that? It was the, it was the Jewish people. Amen? Amen. So one thing that we just make this first point. When we look at predestination, God is ultimately in charge. And yet at the same time, man is intimately involved in what God is doing. Notice what the Bible says. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4. The book of Acts chapter 4 and verse 27 and 28. And when we're there, can we say Amen. Acts chapter 4, verse 27 and 28. The Bible says here, Acts chapter 4, 27 and 28. The Bible says, For truly, this is Peter's uh, sermon here, For truly against your holy servant, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. But then notice what it says in verse 28. The Bible says here, To do... Whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So we find here again this same idea repeated. That it is God that's in control of the death and the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Now, the question that I want to ask you is, if God is in control in the death and the sufferings of Jesus Christ, is man guilty? Is man guilty? Because if God predestined this to take place... If this was God's purpose that Christ should be led as a lamb to the slaughter, is man guilty for when this is what God wanted to happen? See, some nodding heads, yes. Nobody, okay, yes, man, man is intimately involved. Man's guilt is there. Even though God had predetermined this thing to take place, yet man's free will and man's free choice led him to do it. So man is not innocent in the death of Christ, even though God had predestined this to take place. Are you following me? Yeah. Predestination is not canceling out man's part. God is overruling events in his providence for the purpose of his good pleasure, as we're going to see. But man is also intimately involved in the actions, or man's actions are intimately involved in the... Uh, how can I put it? In the, in the providence of God. And man is still guilty for the choice and the part that he plays in the death of Jesus Christ. Now the Bible lets us know that even though God led Christ as a lamb to the slaughter. When he knew and he understood the Bible says here again in verse 28. To do whatever your hand and your purpose determined for to be done. When man was guilty in the death of Christ, the very death itself made a provision for the guilt of man in order that man might be saved. Now, I just want us to look at a few verses here. I invite you to go with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. We find here in Romans chapter 3 that...
the Lord himself, God the Father, had already given Christ, foreordained, the Bible says, for the purpose of the salvation of man. Romans chapter 3 and verse 25. The Bible says here, let's begin with verse 24. The Bible says here, being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, verse 25, read that with me, whom, who everybody? Whom God did what? God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Now the point that I want us to look at is in the first part of verse 25 where the Bible says whom God hath set forth. What does the word set forth mean? In the King James, the word might be uh, foreordained, or if set forth simply means someone who was foreordained or somebody who was already predetermined as a sacrifice. Are you, are you following me? So I, I want to stop my sermon right here. I don't feel comfortable following notes. I just want to speak very plainly to you as brothers and sisters in Christ. If we as Christians are going to fulfill... Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. Revelation chapter 18, verse 1, where the Bible says, I saw a mighty angel coming down from heaven, and the earth was lightened with his glory. If we're going to fulfill that, we need an experience with Christ. Um, my, my dear sister was talking about the testimony, you know, about not having to leave the church. I think that's the best testimony, is that you actually never had to step away from Jesus. The best testimony is to grow up knowing Christ. The best testimony is to have loved Jesus from a child and to grow up in the church, to never leave Christ, to know him and to love him. And we will never fulfill the work that God wants us to do as Seventh-day Adventists or Christians in general. We'll never fulfill the purposes that God wants us to have if we don't have an intimate, personal understanding of God's love for us. One of the problems that we face as Seventh-day Adventists with our uh, evangelical brethren is that often they believe in once saved, always saved. Who's heard of once saved, always saved? Raise your hand. Everybody pretty much has read, heard of once saved, always saved. It's the belief that the first time I give my heart to Jesus, I am eternally secure. And therefore, they, they, they have this need, just like everybody else has. They have this need to feel that they are loved by God and that they are in a saving relationship with Him. And the problem with many Seventh-day Adventists is that they never feel that. They never know that they have a saving relationship with Christ. They look at the judgment as some time period where if my works are not good enough, I'm not going to be able to stand before God. If my works are not good enough, I'm not going to be able to be saved. If I'm not perfect, I'm not going to be able to go through the time of trouble and therefore they revert into like, I wish we were like the evangelicals who believe once saved, always saved because they want that assurance of salvation. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you want to be assured that somebody loves you? Amen. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Amen. How many of you want to be assured that somebody loves you? How many of you want to be assured that when you give your heart to Jesus, that he has taken it, that he has accepted it? And that he is going to hold you and keep you by his grace. How many of you really want to have that experience? This is the biblical understanding of what God wants us to know in predestination. The Bible lets us know that God has predestined every single one of us to be saved. Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, we often focus a lot on end-time events, the mark of the beast, and we, we read the great controversy, and we read uh, uh, books that tell us about the end time, and we have charts that point out end-time events, and the mark of the beast, and prison, and, and running, you know, into the hills and the mountains, and, and these are the things that we think about, and we say, how am I going to be able to go through that time period? How many of you have ever said, you know what, I hope God puts me to rest before I get to that time period? Raise your hand. Be honest. All right, praise the Lord. We have some honest people here that say, I want to be put to death because I don't think that I'm going to be able to go through that time of trouble. Our mind is thinking about what we are going to do in the time of trouble instead of resting 
and what Christ has promised that He's going to do for us and in us and through us in the time of trouble. Our minds are worried about what's going to happen when we get placed before kings and, and governors and when we get put into prison and when they're about to take our life and we're scared and we're like, am I going to be able to go through it? Let, let me give you an example that took place in the Bible. Who knows Peter? The story of Peter. Peter, before Christ's death, before the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told him, Peter, you're going to deny me. And what did Peter say? Vehemently, what did Peter say? Lord, if everybody leaves you, I will never leave you. Jesus said it again. Peter, I promise you, you're going to deny me. Peter said, Jesus, if I have to die with you, I'll never deny you. And what did Jesus say to him? Peter, before the cock crows three times, most assuredly you will deny me. Peter is just like each and every one of us before we've experienced the converting power of God's grace. We think a certain way about what we will do in connection with what Jesus wants us to do. Are you understanding what I'm saying? We think about how we're going to be able to stand. We think about what we are going to be able to do in our own strength based on our works or based on how much we practice to try to obey God. And we need to understand that it wasn't until Pentecost when Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost when Peter had seen the Savior die for him. Amen? It wasn't until Peter saw Jesus die for him. It wasn't until he understood that he had betrayed Jesus. It wasn't until he had wept bitterly in repentance for his part in the death of Christ that Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost. But after the day of Pentecost, how many times did Peter go to prison? How many times did Peter go to prison? Read the Bible. Read the book of Acts. You'll find that Peter went to prison various times. Did Peter now pick up a sword and try to fight his way out of prison? He just took it, didn't he? And as a matter of fact, when he got beaten and put in prison and they let him out, what did he go back and do? He went right back knowing that if he did it, where was he going to go? He was going to go right back to prison. Did Peter's experience change before the cross and after the cross? It changed, amen? The cross was the changing point in the life of Peter. And brethren, as Seventh-day Adventists, the cross is the changing point in our life. If we will fulfill the purpose of God for us as Seventh-day Adventists, and as Christians, if you're not a Seventh-day Adventist yet, God's purpose will be fulfilled in those three angels of Revelation chapter 14 through a people who have met Jesus. Now the assurance that we need to be able to go through the time of trouble, this is what we want to talk about tonight. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, one of my most favorite passages in the entire uh, uh, body of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 1. God, brethren, in the Bible, if you would study the New Testament and Paul's writings especially, you would find how much God has predetermined each and every one of us to be saved. God, as a matter of fact, in no, uh, uh, in no, uh, how can I say, in no subtle language, in very clear and pronounced words, has spoken that he has predestinated every single one of us to be saved. Now again, as we began with our, with our example in the beginning, our decisions play heavily into the results of God's purpose. Amen? Amen? Nevertheless, they are still God's purpose. Notice what the Bible says, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 and onward. When we're there, can we say amen? Amen. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, the Bible says, Blessed be who? Blessed be who? Now, now think about that word, blessed. When, when you say bless you, or when the Bible uses that term blessed, how do you think the Bible is using that term? Is that just like a very cordial, hello, good evening, how are you doing? What do you think Paul is saying when he says bless? Is it just something that he's using to fill up some space? Or is Paul's heart and mind really praising God for what God has done? 
Now, if, if Paul is saying blessed, that means that there is something praiseworthy of what he's about to say. Are you following me? Yeah. Notice what the Bible says that is so praiseworthy. The Bible says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has done what? He has blessed us. Okay. Blessed be God because what has he done? Blessed. He has blessed us. And now what has God blessed us with? The Bible says, who has blessed us with what, everybody? Spirit. Every spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. In Christ. Where are our blessings? In Christ. Where does God want us to be? In heaven. Where should our whole focus be? In Christ. Should our focus be on how we keep the Sabbath? Should our focus be on how we eat, how we drink, or how we dress, even though they are an extremely important part of God's counsel? Should our focus be on what we ought to do, or should our focus be on what we have in Christ? Our focus should be on what we have in in Christ. When we focus on what we have in Christ, then the Bible says it is God that worketh in you both to will and do of uh, His good pleasure. Our focus, brethren, the reason why we get off track is because we focus on yes. we focus on us. Amen? We focus on our failures. We focus on how the fact that we haven't done this. We focus on how we haven't done that or we focus on how hard we're trying to do this. How hard I'm trying to do that. How hard I'm trying to please God. Are you understanding me? Yeah. We focus on these things instead of focusing on what God has given us in Christ. If we would focus on what God has given us in Christ, our life, our Christian experience would totally be different. It would totally be different. We wouldn't be scared about telling people about Jesus. Because it would fill our hearts when we know Christ our hearts are filled with His love, and it's easy to tell others about Him. Amen? Instead of trying to force ourselves, like, we're scared to talk about Him as though we don't believe that He's going to be with us. Notice what the Bible says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now, how much, let me ask you that question, how much does the text say that God has blessed you with? All spiritual blessings. How many spiritual blessings are you missing in your life? Now, not from the text. In practical reality, how many blessings are you missing in your life? I don't know. In your present everyday walk, how many blessings are you missing out on? How many things are you not experiencing that you could experience... If you are putting your focus on Christ instead of on yourself. Are, are you you're following me? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. How many blessings has God given us? Every or all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And where are these spiritual blessings? In Christ. The Bible says going on. Just as he did what everybody? He chose who? Now, when the Bible says us, and, and, and I like this thing that Ellen White said. She said that when we read the Bible, we should read God's promises as though they are speaking to us individually. Now, I find that personally, I've, I've often had the problem of reading the Bible as the Word of God, but not the Word of God speaking to me individually. How many of you have had that problem? We, we study the Bible. We, you know, pastors, we like to study the Bible, don't we? We like to get into the Word. We want to we see the deeper parts of the Word. We want the meat. We want the heavy stuff so that we can share it with you. But we often fail to get really what God is trying to give. God is trying to give us. And if we would read the Bible as though the Bible is telling me that I have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus, just as He chose who? All right, everybody say me. As he chose who? Me. As he chose who? Me. Me. When did he choose me? When did he choose me, everybody? Before what? Before the foundation of the world. Now, let me ask you a question. 
If Jesus chose you, if God the Father chose you before the foundation of the world, how many of your works does it take for God to choose you? Are you sure? Then why do we walk around acting like it is our works that bring us merit before Christ? How often do we, how often do we let our own works influence how we believe how God looks at us? You ever have that problem? Anybody here ever have that problem? Amen? I'll raise my hand because I have. We allow our works to break the assurance of our salvation. Where is our assurance of salvation found in? Christ. It's found in Christ and in the fact that God the Father chose us in Christ when? Before any of us had ever done one wrong act and before any of us had ever done one right act. Our salvation, brethren, though we have a part to play in it by choosing to come to Jesus Christ, Amen. Our salvation, though we have a part to play in it, who is the author of our founding of our salvation? Christ. Who did it begin with? Christ. Who thought about it? Christ. I want you to notice what the Bible says going on. The Bible says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And now I want you to notice what is it that God chose you? Before the foundation of the world for. What does the Bible say going on? That we, me, I, everybody read it like I, that I should be what? Holy, Holy and no. without blame before him in love. Has God predestined your victory over your sins? Has God predestined that you learn how to keep the Sabbath properly? Amen. Amen. Has God predestined that you learn how to eat properly? Come on, everybody. Amen? Has God predestined that we live and use our money and our time and our talents in a way that are honorable to Him? Has God predestined that the defects of your characters, because we need to understand that God knows where we were born. Amen? He takes note. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, He knows the, it shall be written that this man was born here and that this man was born there. God knows the situations that we were raised in. God knows our parents, whether they're alcoholics, whether they're fornicators, whether they're good people, whether they're bad people. God has a total knowledge of everything that you deal with, everything that was genetically passed on to you. Do any of you genetically suffer from anger? Yeah. Or genetically suffer from poor self-esteem? Or genetically suffer from some kind of... Uh, 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 how should I say? Some kind of bent towards alcohol or drug addiction or sexual addiction. Maybe we won't raise our hands on those things, but in our hearts, some of us know that we have more of a bent yeah. to some of these things. Does Christ know that we were born in that? Amen. And what was his predetermined choice for us? That we who have these bent towards this and that and the other, we who have these predetermined, predisposed tendencies toward these things, what was his predetermined purpose for us? That we should be what, everybody? Holy. Holy. And how else? Without blame before him, or in other words, in his presence. God has predestined every one of us to be spotless. God has predestined us to be part of that great multitude that will stand before him one day in white robes that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. The Bible says going on in verse 4, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we, that I, you, should be holy and without blame before him in love. And then again, that same idea he chose us, it's used in verse 5, having done what everybody? Having predestinated us unto the what, everybody? Adoption of children or adoption as sons by who? Yes, by Jesus Christ to who? Yes. To himself. Our adoption, what, what, what is God's chosen method to adopt us? Through Jesus. 
through Jesus Christ. Where is our hope of adoption? In our Sabbath keeping, in our vegan vegetarianism, in our dress reform, in our paying tithe, where is our predestin our predestination uh, founded upon? Jesus. Jesus Christ. Why shouldn't we talk about him more? Yeah, man. Why shouldn't we think about him more? Are, are we scared to talk to Christ? No. Are we scared that he doesn't hear us because we haven't been good enough? Brother, we will never be able to do anything in any way, shape, or form which will be good enough to merit the love of God. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Amen. That we should be holy and without blame. He predestinated us. Now, he understood. Now, the idea is here, adoption. Now, when God created Adam, the Bible says in the book of Luke chapter 2, I believe it is, or chapter 3, when it talks about Jesus' is his family line. When it brings us all the way back to the end, the Bible says that he was the son of Adam, who was the son of who? Who was the son of God. When God created man, did God have to adopt man? No. No. Why? He was already what? He was already his son. We are already his sons, right? He was already our father. But God, because he understood that sin had the possibility of entering in, had already predetermined that Christ should die for us and thereby have a way that we might become his sons again. Amen? Amen. Amen. Through the death of Jesus Christ, we become the sons and daughters of God again. Amen. Now let me ask you a question. As, as we deal practically, because... I, I, as, a, as growing up a Seventh-day Adventist, as, as somebody who was called to ministry and felt uh, uh, that God wanted me to be holy, and I saw how many times I failed. Let me share a five-minute uh, testimony with you. I was called to ministry 2000 and, 2002. In 2002, one of the pastors at the church that I was attending said, you know what, I, the Lord showed me that he wants you to be uh, a minister. And I was really surprised, but it was something that I wanted to do because as a young child, I, I, I thought pastors go to heaven because they're good people. I wanted to go to heaven. Amen? Uh, just being honest, I wanted to go to heaven, so I thought pastors are good people. They're going to go to heaven. I want to be a pastor. I deviated in my Christian walk because I really didn't know what Adventism taught. Um, through the circumstances and the, and the providence of God's predetermined plan for my life. Um, in 2002, I started attending a church that I really began to understand Adventism as, as God really had uh, given it to us. Um, around fall of 2002 or 2003, um, I was offered the opportunity to be a Bible worker. And I was excited because I thought, here's my time to shine as the man of God that I think that I'm going to be. I'm going to preach the prophecies and I'm going to tell people about the second coming of Jesus and I'm going to tell them about the mark of the beast. And notice I'm not saying anything about telling people about Jesus. Amen? I'm not talking about telling people about Jesus. I'm talking about telling them about how we should eat. And how we should live and keeping the seventh day and the prophecies of Daniel and the little horn and, and all of the truths that are have been combined for these last days. But Jesus was not in my in my focus because I thought I already knew him. I thought now I'm a seventh day Adventist. I've grown up. I'm Lord, I'm giving you my heart. The Lord broke literally by believing his word, broke the power of marijuana in my life. It was the most incredible thing because I was bound. And God delivered me. So I knew something had happened in my life. Amen? Amen. So I'm ready to go to Las Vegas as the, the top shop Bible worker. I, I was very humble. I didn't, you know, wasn't like, hey, look at me. You know, this is not my personality. But, but as I, I'm going and I'm working, I'm knocking on doors. And we're working day in, day night, you know, day out. And um, I got two people baptized. And my friend had about 40 people baptized. And I said, hold on, something is going on. Because, Lord, I'm trying to do everything that you want me to do. 
I'm trying to drink eight glasses of water a day. <laughs> Some people laugh, but that's how, that's how serious I was. I have to eat how God wants me to eat. I'm not going to eat between meals. I'm going to wear long sleeves. Amen? I'm going to keep dress reform. I'm going to keep health reform. I'm going to do whatever God wants me to do. And there was no Jesus in my religion. And through a series of uninspiring events, I started to read the book Steps Across. You have to understand that every time God put it in my mind to read the book Desire of Ages or Steps of Christ, I, I, in my mind I said, I don't need to read that. That's for somebody else. I already know who Jesus is. So I, I'm, I'm, I got so discouraged that instead of going out in the field, I tell my partner, yeah, I'm going out. She's like, okay, where are you going? All right, I'm going here. And I get in my car and I drive and I park in a parking lot somewhere. And I sit down. Instead of going out and knocking on doors, I open the book Steps of Christ. And I find how much I don't know Jesus. And that was the hardest, most difficult experience I've ever had. For somebody who wanted nothing more than to be ready for Jesus to come. To find out that I did not know Him. It took years before I actually understood that repentance is a gift of God. It took years before I actually understood how much God, Christ, was involved in my salvation. It took years before I finally actually believed that He loved me and saved me. In 2008, in a camp meeting in Georgia, United States, I met Jesus as my Savior. I actually believed now that when I prayed to him, he was listening to me. Before that, I would pray, but I was never sure that he was listening to me because I thought, have I done everything possibly right that I know to do? Have I missed anything? So I get up to preach on Sabbath morning, and I'm praying. I'm praying, and I'm praying, and I'm praying, and I have no assurance that God's going to be with me. You know why? Because I'm thinking about all of the things that I have or have not done to merit his faith. Can you imagine the pastor talking about Jesus' second coming and he doesn't even know who Jesus is? That's why my, my deep desire, brethren, is that every one of you know for yourself who Jesus is. Adventism, I'm going to say this in a kind way, it's got to be the most boring religion if you don't know Jesus. It's got to be the worst. The worst of the worst. Amen? Is everybody else at least, they get to, you know, after church on Sunday, you get to go to the shops or go play footy and do whatever you want. Amen? You know, you get to go out and, and do your thing and nobody's going to, you know, you go to work on Sunday if you have to and nobody's going to get mad about it because that's all right. But Friday sunset to Sabbath sunset, don't run, don't play, don't kick the ball. You know, we do it anyways. Amen? But we shouldn't do it. Right? And how unhappy are we? That's why we leave the church. That's why we go where everybody else is going because we're not finding any satisfaction in our parents' religion because we don't know Jesus. And we must understand that our salvation, the gift of God, is something that God wants to give every one of us. Are you, are you following me? Amen. 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 We need to know for ourselves, God wants to do this thing for me. I may be messed up right now, but Jesus wants to save me. He wants to change me. That's His purpose. So instead of me focusing on how much I need to change, instead of me focusing how much on what I need to do, what should we begin to do? We should begin to focus on how much He wants me to be saved. On how much He wants to be in me to keep the Sabbath so that I don't get bored on the Sabbath day and want to cut the TV on or go hang out with my friends and have a uh, just a, another day after we went to church. Are you following me? Amen? Christ wants us to be very clear that His plan is that we should be saved. Mm -hmm. The Bible says going on, 
having predestinated us to as to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. And I wish I could really emphasize how much God is trying to sell us, tell us when he says by Christ or in Christ. But the Bible says going on anyways. According, the Bible says, having predestinated us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to what, everybody? Now, really get that one. According to what? The good pleasure of his will. Think about those words. Is God saving you as a, this is something that I must do, otherwise nobody will like me kind of thing? Or is God doing this because this is who he is and this is what he wants to do? What is the language that the scripture points to? What is the, what's the language that the scripture points to? The Bible says it is his good what, everybody? It is his good what? Pleasure. pleasure. Now, what is pleasure? Something that makes you joyful. Something that makes you happy. Something that pleases you, right? Yeah. Amen. We get pleasure in all kinds of things. Some of us get pleasure in sports. Some get pleasure in TV. Some get pleasure in food. God gets pleasure in what? In his thought to save you. That gives God pleasure. It gives God pleasure to send angels to you when you're thrown on the floor drunk. It gives God pleasure to send people to your door when you're about to commit suicide. It gives God pleasure to take you from a life of fornication and drugs or on the other side. It gives God pleasure to take you from a life of just sitting in church, being dead, not knowing Him. It gives God pleasure to save you. Amen. Nothing pleases God more than to know that if you will just cooperate with His plan for your life, that one day, you're going to be standing before Him. One day, you're going to take off your crown at the feet of Jesus and throw it to Him and say, Lord, it was nothing that I have done. It was all you. I want you to notice how this, I know i got like three minutes left. I want you to notice how this pans out. The Bible says here, look at what it says here in verse, um, verse 6. According to the good pleasure of His will, to the what, everybody? To the praise of the glory of His Amen. grace. Now that statement basically breaks down to this. One day, the end result of what God has is that everybody will praise Him for His grace. One day, all the heavenly universe is going to gather around us and they're going to see the trophies of Christ's blood. That's why Isaiah 53 says, He shall see the travail of His soul and shall be satisfied. One day, as we follow Jesus throughout heaven, and he points to those redeemed from grave by grace, one, taken from the gutter, one, taken from prostitution, one, taken from being uh, 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 emotionally destroyed through child abuse, one, taken from just sitting in a church, dead and lifeless, and he's going to point to them and say, these are the trophies of my love. Now let me ask you a question. Can you see yourself there? Amen. Can you see yourself there? Because this passage should at least spark hope enough in your life to say, that's what God wants for me. Amen. God can take me. I might be bored sitting here tonight. I might be bored. I might just, you know, okay, I'm here. That might be you tonight. But God wants to spark something in your heart tonight to say, my child, I love you. Amen. I want to say it. Amen. I promise you. Time of trouble, don't worry. I've got you. Amen. I went through all of it. When we studied Gethsemane and Calvary and Pilate's Judgment Hall, all of that was Christ's time of trouble so that when you go through it, you will always have confidence that when he went through it, he was able to stand and he promises that he'll be with me and he'll never leave me. Now, I want you to notice what the Bible says. The Bible says again, To the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He hath made us accepted in who? If you have Jesus, God has accepted you. 
It's not if you have the Sabbath or if you have dress reform or if you have the spirit of prophecy. If you have Jesus, God has accepted you when nobody else has. The Bible says, if you turn with me to Revelation chapter 5 as we close. I love Revelation chapter 4, 5, and 6, and 7. But one of my favorite passages here is in Revelation chapter 4 where the 24 elders, and the, or Revelation chapter 5 where the 24 elders and the four living beasts fall, fall down and worship the Lamb. And I can picture, the Bible says here, as a matter of fact, chapter 4, verse 9, gives us where the Bible said, to the praise of the glory of His grace. One day, the entire universe will gather around the throne of God and praise Him for His saving grace. Revelation 4 through 7 has seven hymns that begin with the four living creatures around His throne. They sing praise to God. And then you have the four living creatures and the 24 elders. They sing praise to God. And then they sing another song to the Lamb. And then the next song has the four living creatures, the 24 elders, and all of the angels around the throne of God praising the Lamb. And then the next song in the same chapter has the four elders, the, tw uh, the 24 elders, the four beasts, all of the angels, and then everyone in heaven and in earth and underneath the earth. Can you see what the Bible is doing? It is making bigger and bigger and bigger. More people and more people and more people are joining in the praise of the glory of His grace. Look at what happens here in verse uh, 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him that sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. And then what do they do? What does the Bible say? They do what? They cast their crowns before the throne saying what, everybody? You are worthy. Now, in Revelation, those crowns that the saints wear, they're the Stephanos crown. It, it's like the Olympics. Back in the day in Greece, they used to have the laurel, you know? You see the Greeks wearing the leaves on their head. Now we wear the, the, the medals. That's what that crown is, right? That crown only goes to the overcomer. Now imagine, if you're an overcomer, how close, how close you must be with Jesus. How, how, how deeply sanctified you must be if you're going to be an overcomer. Imagine that you ran a race. Imagine that you, you won the gold medal. That took a lot of effort, didn't it? Amen. Amen? If you win something in the Olympics, doesn't it take a lot of effort? Amen. Now, again, remember that that crown is the same idea as that, as that Olympic medal. And here's the idea. We take off our Olympic medals, that all of that quote-unquote effort that it took for us to win, and we throw them at Jesus' feet because what does that tell us? All of that effort, really, I didn't have anything to do with it. Because their praise, what does it say? You are worthy. What do they say? You're worthy. Anybody and everybody who is saved will never be saved and will never ever think about what they did. They will never be saved or think about their own works. They will always say, Lord, you are worthy. You got me here. You chose me to be here. What did I do? I simply said yes when the angels ministered to me. When the Holy Spirit spoke to me through the pastor, I said yes. When I opened the Bible and I began to read and your spirit began to minister to me and the angels were in the room talking to me when I was hopeless, when I was perverse, when I was sinful, you came to me and I just said yes. Everybody will say, Lord, you are worthy. Amen. Notice what the Bible says from my last text, verse chapter 5 and verse uh, chapter 5 and verse 9. The Bible says, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Why? For you were slain, and 
You have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nations. And it's understood and you understood have made us kings and priests to our gods, our God, and we shall reign on the earth. When people sing praise throughout eternity, it is always going to be, Jesus, this is what you have done. Jesus, I'm here because of what you did for me. Christ, I'm here because of your blood. And brethren, as we close this evening, I just want us to catch a glimpse of the fact that God's predetermined plan for us is that we should trust in the blood of the Lamb. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, and they overcame him, Satan, the accuser of the brethren, ever been accused? Amen? Your conscience ever tell you you're never going to be able to make it? Satan ever tell you you're not going to be able to gain the victory? Satan ever tell you you're never going to be able to change? Satan ever tell you you don't want to change? The Bible says they overcame him, Satan, the accuser, the liar, the deceiver, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony, and they love not their lives even unto the death. If you and I are going to be there one day proclaiming those messages undaunted and unscared, it's only going to be because we've learned to trust in the blood of the Lamb, and that's it. The blood of Christ alone is our only sufficiency. The blood of Christ throughout the whole book of Revelation, that is the one thing that is worthy of of honor and praise and glory. It is Christ's blood. And so, my brothers and my sisters, if you don't know Jesus yet, I want to encourage you that He loves you. If you haven't, if you don't have the assurance of your salvation, if you've never trusted that if you were to come to Him tonight and give Him your heart, if you've never trusted that, brethren, I want you to understand that you can trust that. I was like that one time. Amen? I'm standing up here as a man who knows and believes the God that had the, the love that God has towards me, but I was somebody sitting where you are tonight, not having believed that Jesus loved me. Having believed that I had to do a lot of things in order to please God. Having to eat a certain way and dress a certain way and talk and act a certain way in order to have Jesus love me. But now that I know that he loves me, now he can do all those things in me that I try to do in my own strength, now I can let him do it. Amen? Amen. And so tonight, that's my, I just want to exhort you, I want to encourage you to believe in the blood of the Lamb. One day, you'll be able to stand before his throne, and I guarantee you, you'll take off your crown and throw it at his feet and say, Jesus, I didn't do anything to get here. It was you. Amen? Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and be with you. Amen. Have a happy Sabbath.